For those who are politically wise, a show about the lives of Christians in Ohio involved with politics. Introducing your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Greetings, my fellow patriots, saints, and sinners. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. This week's show is an interview with Representative Bill Hayes, recorded in his office at the Ohio State House. At the end of the show, there will be a blessing. Don't miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Next time you're thinking about beating the train, think again. It takes a typical freight train traveling 50 miles an hour, one and a half miles to stop. That's nearly 18 football fields. Don't try to beat the train. Ohio's roads can be highways or dieways. The choice is yours. A message from Operation Lifesaver and this station. The opinions and statements on this show belong to those who give them. The rest of the show belongs to Thomas Wise Words, all rights reserved. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. So uh, tell us, my listeners, uh, who you are. I am Bill Hayes. I'm a state representative for the Ohio House 72nd District, which includes all of Perry County, all of Coshocton County, and about half of Licking County, the southeast geographic corner. All right. And what do you do here at the State House? What committees are you on? Okay, I serve on the Judiciary Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Education Committee. And Finance, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee on K-12 Education. And what did you do before you come in getting elected to office? Where I this, came here. this office, where you came here. Where, where's my real world? Yeah, we're, okay. we're, I still uh, practice law in Pataskala with uh, two of my sons and two other attorneys. Uh, there's five of us there. And they let me do this, uh, and they kind of cover for me there. And it works out great. I get to work a couple days a week uh, when we're not real busy down here. Sometimes I don't, but uh, I still get to have some fun there at the office. What type of law did you practice there? Uh, general, you our, our office is a general practice. We don't do any criminal. We don't do any bankruptcy, but we do uh, basically family and small town practice type stuff and uh, keep us real busy. We also have a real estate title agency where we do real estate closings and that sort of thing. Really? Yeah. Really? So how, how, how much of that work do you, do you do? I do some of that. In fact, I just did a contract over the weekend for somebody and I got it out to them. Uh, but uh, I spend most of my time doing uh, state planning. And probate work after people passed away, I help with the uh, probate in the estates. Okay, great. How um, then? I mean, you were you were a county commissioner? No, nope, oh, I didn't have much political background at all. Uh, I had uh, served as a law director for the city of Patasco. Patasco is an interesting uh, community. It used to be just a sleepy little village, and as Columbus was creeping east, uh, one of the townships out there, a former Lima township was worried about Columbus taking them over. So the entire township merged with a little village next to it and created the city of Patasco, which is now 42 square miles, six miles by seven. It's, a big, it's actually one of the biggest cities in Ohio, geographic size. Uh-huh. Uh, it only has between fifteen and 20,000 people perhaps right now. I do not represent that area. As a matter of fact, I actually live a little east of that. Mm. And uh, my, my residence is actually in Harrison Township in Licking County. But uh, in my, uh, I have very little prior political world uh, experience. I'm uh, not in this for the politics, but more for the policy issues. Uh, but in about uh, 2005, I was, uh, uh, you'll find it interesting, I was teaching a Sunday school class and have for several years in my church, and I was telling them that I thought that we should get involved and uh, uh, not necessarily run for office, but find people to back that are good people and uh, to support them, either financially or walking with them or telling people to go vote and that sort of thing. And uh, I was really on pretty good about that when an opportunity shows itself and uh, that sort of thing. And I had told my family I'd ch- challenge this class and all that. Well, my son came to me and told me, Dad, the state representative office is going to be open because of the circumstances. Uh, yeah. There's going to be an open seat. Suggested I run, which I did in the 2006 race, lost, uh, ran again in 2008 and lost, and uh, 
probably thought I should quit. And my wife and I actually thought that it was something we were supposed to be doing. We worked at it very hard to try to get elected. And in fact, when we lost the first time, we kind of questioned God. Uh, we thought we were supposed to be doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it turned out we didn't win. But uh, uh, actually, I was not going to run again. I threw my signs away uh, and everything. But uh, something happened in 2010. And lo and behold, I decided to run again. So I did and got elected. So I have served one term. That's completed now. I'm just starting my second term. Excellent, excellent. Um, how? So like an Abraham Lincoln kind of, thing, kind of thing, where he he failed and failed until he became president of the United States. And yeah. He fell forward, huh? And yeah. Right. <laughs> fell forward. And we will be right back after the break. To some people, they're just a pet, a dog or a cat. But to you, they're part of your family. They've shared your lives, provided companionship, and given unconditional love. And just like when a human family member passes on, you want your four-legged family members to be treated with dignity. Baker Hazel and Snyder Funeral Home and Crematory has been caring for families since 1941 and now offers the same level of service for your pets at Snyder Pet Crematory. Call 274-1151. 274-1151. Being a Sunday school teacher, how how does that your faith play in to what your work here do, and, and how how what how, where do you see you know God and government type of? I'll just open that in that question, and you answer that any way you want. Right. Well, it's kind of interesting. I I was real curious. Uh, let me clarify the Sunday school teaching thing right now. Right now, I'm not teaching because we do not have a piano player, and I play a little piano. And we have two services that run together, and we run our Sunday school with our services. So I, I'm not able to teach right now. So I play piano in two services presently, but and that's really fun. It's a little praise band, and uh -huh. uh, the other people are really good, so I just have to play a little background. So it's very cool. Uh, but as far as uh, the politics and uh, your religion and your Christianity and how you feel about that when you come down here, I came down really wondering what it was going to be like if it was a— bunch of people I couldn't get along with, if they were all going to be people who didn't uh, respect uh, religion or your faith. And lo and behold, it wasn't a day or two, but what I found that there were a lot of people like me here, uh, other people who uh, attend church every week and are serving in their churches and in their communities. And uh, before long, I found out that there was a little group that met for prayer on Wednesday morning, which you happen to know about, because yes. you, you come each week as well. But uh, that group is very encouraging, as well as I know there are others who don't meet in that group that are also uh, of the faith. And uh, that was extremely encouraging to me just to see that there are people here who uh, have those kind of values in mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. And and you see it in the work that we do, that that's, uh, that's what's going on. So uh, I don't find uh, my religion to be any kind of a... a anything that inhibits me getting anything done down here. It's really a, a place where people work together and uh, there's a lot of respect for the fact that uh, we know who the real leader is and that's our Lord. Amen. And Amen. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we're here to do is his work. And, and, you know, we don't run around preaching to people, but we all know that we, have, we are uh, tied to the same common bond in Christ. So we're, we're glad to be here and doing the work that we are. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So, and, and so what, how, how has God been? And we will be right back after the break. Have you ever driven over a pop can? Well, when a train collides with a car, it has the same force as a car running over a pop can. Obey the warnings at railroad crossings. Don't try to beat the train. Ohio's roads can be highways or dieways. The choice is yours. A message from Operation Lifesaver. What does your faith apply in your faith here? What type of bills have you put forth that, that you know, you took, took real acts of faith on your part? Yeah, uh, that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I ran, when I ran, I ran on the uh, platform of smaller government. And so when I came here, I I told myself I had to really be careful because passing a lot of bills is not creating smaller government. That's creating more government. And so I've not been a guy who's introduced a lot of bills. I've introduced a few, uh, but I've just kind of waited and watched to see what where there is something that I might be able to do. And that did happen in my first term. 
uh, a situation came up, and it's interesting that it was the prayer group that met, really brought it to f fruition. But I became aware of a situation that was going on in our uh, in our public state universities, where they were uh, planning to tell any faith-based student organization that they were not going to be recognized on campus. And the reason for that, the rationale for it, was almost astounding, but it's, here's what it was. It was astounding in that the, they said that these organizations, these student religious faith-based organizations, were discriminatory, and they couldn't let them be on campus because they were. And the reason they were claiming they were discriminatory was that they required anybody who wanted to be a member or an officer to believe what they believed. In other words, sign a faith statement that they, you know, they believe in, in some of the basic Christian principles. And they said that was being discriminatory. Anybody should be able to join every organization on campus. And so that was going to be a problem in that they were not, not going to recognize them as student groups on campus. And what that did to these organizations, like Campus Crusade and a whole list of others, uh, was that they were not going to be able to meet on the campus in campus facilities. They were not going to be able to use the campus uh, bulletin board on the website to announce their meetings. They were not going to be able to use emails that were available to organizations. And they were not going to get any funding, which almost all, well, I think all student organizations on campus, state universities, get a small budget to work with just to do some uh, events and that sort of thing. They were going to lose all that. And it turned out that uh, uh, how, how it got to me was that um, we had been aware or aware of some things going on in another university that this was going on at all the state universities, including, including our local Ohio State University. But there had been another university that was giving a, a Christian organization called Christian Legal Society difficulty in being on their campus. And as a reason, um, my sons and I are members of the Christian Legal Society, which is just an organization of lawyers and judges from all over the United States and the world, in fact. Uh, but there's a chapter here, and my son was at a meeting where this issue came up, what was going on at the universities and with the campus ministries. And they were talking about the issue, and they were afraid that these organizations were getting kicked, going to get kicked out in 2010. And lo and behold, they said, if we knew somebody in the state legislature, we could maybe get something done about this. And my son raised his hand and said, well, my dad's a state legislator. I don't know if he could help. Well, it turned out they met with me. Uh, within a week, we had a draft put together of a bill, but we knew that that bill was going to be a problem getting the problem resolved fast enough. Mm -hmm. Most bills take at least six or eight months or a year, maybe never get passed, as, as you know. But it turned out that uh, Ron Omstutz was on the, uh, he was the budget chairman, finance chairman, and he was in the prayer group, and I had mentioned this to him, and he said that might be something we could put in the budget. And lo and behold, we had the thing done in two more. It was done like in two or three weeks and finished. Uh, so it, it stopped that threat to uh, basically kick everybody off campus. And that was something that was just fun to sit back and watch happen uh, because it just happened. Isn't that amazing how God works that way sometimes? It sure is. It sure is. And we have a similar thing going on right now in the current budget. I have another thing that came to my uh to my attention that involves any kind of faith-based organization, Christian, Muslim, Jew, whatever. Uh, and it is it involves the Ohio Civil Rights Act. And the Ohio Civil Rights Act was written before the Federal Civil Rights Act. And the Ohio Civil Rights Act did not exempt uh, faith-based organizations, as the federal does. And so I'm trying, I've, I've got an amendment in, and it's still in the budget, we hope it stays. But that amendment would actually make the Ohio law like the federal law, which would exempt uh, faith-based organizations from complying with the discriminatory mm -hmm. provisions of the Civil Rights Act. And it's not that we're going to discriminate, but it is that you can hire people of your faith to work in your organization. That's what we're wanting to make happen. Right. So. And the reason that came to mind, there was actually an organization who had a problem with that, and and uh, it would discover what the Ohio Act was about, about yeah. and uh, we want to get that fixed. So it's, it's not we're not after anybody or anything. We're just trying to fix the issue. Right, yeah. right, right. So it'll end up making the federal, it, it, the state, and the federal that, rights act them, equal. That's, that's correct. It'll make them the same. That's right. As far as other things that we do here, uh, uh, I find that uh, 
the fact that laws move through this legislature slow is actually probably a good thing. Uh, sometimes they're long and hard to understand when you first get them or get all the details. But the other thing is uh, the fact that we have public hearings uh, during this budget process when I was doing the K-12 education thing. Uh, the people who came and testified made a difference. Uh, we changed things that we, they pointed out to us. And I think when they were written, and some of it was what was in the governor's budget and some was our amendments, but that we'd have superintendents and treasurers and parents and even students come and say, that's really going to mess this up, and they tell us what it is. And I will tell you, we fixed a lot of stuff that we otherwise had messed up. <laughs> so um, you actually, I mean, it, it, it really pays to have the common citizen come in and give testimony. It and, does. And it does. It's and not just lobbyists and it's just not professionals. It's the common people coming in and saying, this is what's, this is how this affects me. Right. And you listen, you hear those, those voices. Yes. And I think through this education process with the K-12 education, uh, we had a few lobbyists, but the lobbyists would represent, um, I would say, the, the folks who spoke, at least in education, and you'll have others over in other issues or in business matters and that sort of thing. But in there, we had people, who, uh, lobbyists to represent teachers and lobbyists that represent school boards and lobbyists that represent treasurers and, and uh, lobbyists that represent the folks with uh, gifted issues and those with uh, early childhood. There's a whole list of people who come, but there might be 10 or 12 of those, but we had, I think we had 130 witnesses uh, give testimony, and I think 100, 100, no, 130 live testimony, and about 30 just gave us some written testimony. Everybody gave their testimony in writing, but then came and did it orally. 130 of them showed up that way. So we had many more of the citizens showed up than mm -hmm. did the lobbyists, and, and the lobbyists typically are coming, speaking for their groups. Uh, but they are very out, very much outnumbered by the uh, by the, the common folks. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Do you pray for a politician? Do you think a politician can be a Christian? Do you think a politician should stand up for Christian principles? Do you think politicians should pray together? Do you want to see more Christians in politics? If you said yes to any of these questions, please join the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network. Find the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network on Facebook. Welcome back to Politically Wise. This week's show is an interview with Representative Bill Hayes, recorded in his office at the Ohio State House. So this is your, your sophomore term? Yeah, I'd be my, I guess you'd call it sophomore term. term yeah. Second term, starting my second term. Uh, the districts changed this time. Uh, in my first term, I represented part of Pickaway County, all of Hocking, all of Perry, and, and part of Licking. Uh, I lost to Pickaway and Hocking, and now I have Perry, a little bit more Licking, and all of Coshocton. But uh, the folks have been very uh, very welcoming uh, in the new county. and uh, I've gotten to know them pretty well, but uh, I'm out there. When we're not here, I'm trying to get over to Coshocton and Mm -hmm. Meet more people in down Perry. I spent all day yesterday in Perry County, and all day tomorrow in Coshocton. What is? How does your your district look economically? Is how's it how's it doing? It's a very agricultural, right? There. Yeah, it's some, it, some city, it's, but it, it's kind of an interesting. I I have uh, I have one city in my district, and that is the city of Coshocton. Mm. Uh, otherwise, uh, in Licking County, I have none. I don't have any of Newark, Granville. Uh, Heath or the city of Pataska, all those are in Jay Hottinger's district. So I'm very much a rule in that part. Uh, however, there is a, a lot of Coshocton that is industrial and manufacturing, and they, they wish there were more because uh, with the uh, this the uh, economic situation in our country, they've lost a lot of jobs over there, and a lot of people are driving from there to wherever they can find a job. Mm. Uh, but uh, Coshocton has quite a bit of industry and, and uh, ready to expand if they can find people to come. And then Western Licking County has a good deal of uh, industry uh, coming, and as a matter of fact, there's quite a, a large industrial park there in Western Licking County, Edna Township. Uh, but the rest of it is uh, very rural, uh, and uh, in some instances not, not very wealthy. Uh, so mm -hmm. they're, uh, 
struggling to make ends meet, families are. The folks, uh, I find them uh, willing to work. I, we've got to, we've got to get, uh, we've got to keep an ethic of being willing to work. Uh, I yes. think we have a part of our culture that uh, is happy, uh, and we're trying to do something to get people out of the Medicaid. Uh, mentality because you can make so much money and still receive Medicaid um, and we want people to really say I'd rather make more money and be on a better job mm -hmm. uh, but there are those who uh, choose to make a lesser amount of money and stay on Medicaid and and that uh, that's not very healthy and I know Ron Amstutz is chairing a group right now that's working on that and I hope they come up with uh, some solutions to uh, bring people to a higher higher level, a higher standard of living. So, so in the house, you serve four terms. Yes, four you, two terms. Yeah, and some people actually serve a little bit more than that. Uh, if uh, if a seat becomes vacant, let's say during the hundred and thirtieth general assembly, and a, a guy gets appointed right now, he finishes that term out, but that's not an elected term, so he gets that term plus four. Mm -hmm. So you can get a little bit more than four years or four terms in here. Ross McGregor, who is serving now, he's called the dean of the house. He's been here the most. And I think that's why. I think he was appointed originally to finish a term. And then he's got four terms to fill out. And this is his last one. So at the end of your time here, what what would you want your epithet? You know, or your the, the, the thank you for all the when you're done. Well, I don't know that I care that I have one that has anything to do with this. I just hope the work we do is good. But uh, at, at, you reminded me of something that's not germane to this, I don't suppose. But it's the old joke about going to the cemetery and on the tombstone it says, uh, here lies a lawyer and a good man. And the guy said, well, I didn't know you could bury two guys in the same place. <laughs> so, All right. <laughs> what advice would you give someone who is wanting to get into the arena of politics or in, you know, run for office or do it following your footsteps? Well, you've got, number one, you've got to uh, not have thin skin. Uh, my first two campaigns were very, very ugly. Uh, if uh, anybody remembers the name Tax Raise Hayes, that was me. And I'd never raised anybody's taxes, but that was a little name that got attached to me by my opponents and they spent a lot of money on that and but but you have to be ready for that and willing to uh, respond uh, but I think you also have to keep in mind who you are and what you are and not get all caught up in that ugly stuff uh, that's really important I think to not do that uh, but it's uh, fundraising becomes a part of the of the deal, and you've got to figure out how to do that and uh, find people to support you. Uh, if you, if if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to meet with them and talk with them. Okay. Uh, kind of give them uh, my my impression, and it may not be the same impression another state rep would give them. But uh, uh, you should get lo involved in your your own local politics. Uh, perhaps run for a local office and get a feel for it. And you find out that uh, when you run for this office, you're running for an office to represent about 120,000 people. In some districts, that's not a huge area. For example, in Columbus, there are only three or four state reps that represent the whole city of Columbus. But if you come out to Lincoln County and where I am, I, I actually run three counties. If you go down to Andy Thompson's district down in uh, Marietta, where he lives, I think he's got five or six counties that he represents and and you find out that you're going to burn the wheels off your car uh, he represents miles. more rabbits than people uh, yeah probably so but uh he, that's the reason he has so many counties is he has to have about that hundred and twenty thousand people in his district so we all have the same number of people and they just have to make the districts large enough that uh, you encompass that many people all right well thank you for giving us your time today is there anything you would feel like you need to add here no, I just want to wish you uh, the best in your endeavor in this show that you're putting on. It's, uh, I think it's going to be great. Uh, I, I know you, actually, from us, our praying together here for several, a couple of years, I think we've been doing this now. Yes, we have. Yes, but we have. Uh, I think you're the man for the job, and I appreciate uh, what you do coming to the State House and praying with us. And 
walking the halls and blessing this place. And uh, I think that's uh, uh, that's keeping the Lord's attention and his eye on, on what we're doing here. I think I'm needed now more than ever. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very, very, well, all right. Well, thank you very surely, much for your time. Best to you. You all bet. Right. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Now, here is your blessing. The blessings today is based on the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord give you peace.